Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. Thanks to our worship team, kind of a skeleton crew today, which is indicative of uh, this latest round of the virus that's going around. Uh, and the reason why we had to cancel last Sunday wasn't because anybody was giving into fear or because of government mandates. It was simply a matter of if you don't have enough players to put on the field, you can't play the game. <laughs> And so many of us were sick last week, including a number of us on staff and a good part of the worship team. Um, the part that you saw here today is already recovered. Uh, the others are, are down and going down like flies. Um, we didn't have enough nursery workers, and, and so it was just becoming a real problem about how we're going to do church in person. So we're grateful to Pastor Ken and Pastor Joe and to Pastor James and the tech crew who were here last week so that at least we could go online. Now that's, you know, one of the silver linings of COVID is we learned how to do that long ago. So uh, uh, thanks for your forbearance, and it's just good to be back in person, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree with me that obedience is an important part of the Christian life? I mean, after all, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you really love me, you're going to do what I say. And so I might ask you this morning, what does your current obedience say about your love for Jesus? What does your obedience to God look like these days? Somebody might say, well, to be honest, my obedience is kind of spotty, you know. I obey him in some things. I obey him in a lot of things, but in other things, eh, not so much. Somebody else might say, well, my obedience is frankly kind of sassy, you know. I argue with God a lot before I finally give in and let him have his way. Somebody else says, my obedience is slow. I usually get around to obeying God, but I drag my feet and take my time. I like the story uh, told by Pastor Lee Eckloff. It's a true story about a first grader in his congregation and his dad. The first grader's name was Max. And the dad said to Max, uh, Max, why didn't you answer when I called you? And Max said, I didn't hear you, Dad. But Dad said, what do you mean you didn't hear me? And Max didn't respond. And finally his dad said, how many times didn't you hear me? And Max said, well, I don't know, maybe three or four. <laughs> Isn't our obedience uh, kind of like that? If, if we show our love for Jesus by how we keep his commandments, how does our spotty, slow, sassy obedience what does that say about our love for him? Maybe our love for Jesus would be more apparent if our obedience looked more like this example. Uh, Martin Baker tells about his uncle, Captain Ray Baker, who served in the Strategic Air Command during, World War, uh, during uh, the Vietnam conflict. And like uh, all pilots of that era, he was taught uh, when a buzzer sounded in the barracks, they were to scramble to their planes and get their planes in the air as fast as possible. Captain Baker was a B-52 bomber pilot. And uh, he said that th there was this one time when Captain Baker was on furlough in California with the family, and they took him to his favorite Mexican restaurant. In the middle of the meal, Captain Baker jumped up and ran out of the building. And Martin went chasing him out into the parking lot where he found the bewildered captain 
looked, searching the horizon for his B-52 bomber. And Martin Baker said, what in the world is going on? And the captain said, I heard the buzzer. Well, they went back in the restaurant and they figured out that right above the table where they sat was a buzzer that the kitchen would ring to call waiters to come and get their meals. And as soon as Captain Baker heard the buzzer, he was scrambling for his jet. His obedience was that immediate. Well, can you imagine what it would look like in 2022 if our obedience to Jesus looked that way? Uh, what if our obedience was that immediate, that unquestioning, that complete? What if every time you felt rebuked by something you read in the Bible this year, you immediately decided to obey? What if every time the Spirit convicted you of sin, you repented on the spot? What if every time God used another believer to speak correction into your life, you received it humbly and took it to heart? What if every time God showed you to do something, you immediately did it? Well, Abraham can teach us something about that kind of obedience. One of the interesting things about Abraham, as we look at his life in Scripture, is that every time God told Abraham directly to do something, he did it. He obeyed on the spot without question. We saw that already back in chapter 12 when God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to leave your home and your family, everything familiar, and go to a place I will show you. And it says he got up and went to Canaan. Well, we're going to see something similar to that here in chapter 12, or chapter 17, rather, it's not that Abram got everything right all the time. As we saw in our last uh, series about Abraham and, and his walk with God, we called it a stumbling faith because Abraham didn't always get it right. He had some blind spots in his faith. He made some mistakes, and, and he made a big one, as we saw last week in chapter 16, when he took matters into his own hands and tried to help God out and only made things worse for himself. But here in chapter 17, we find another good example of Abraham's unquestioning obedience to God when God tells Abraham to circumcise himself, circumcise his son Ishmael, and every male member of his household, he does it. Now, if there was ever a command that God gave that would make my obedience slow and sassy, it's this one. But not Abraham. His example teaches us that obedience is a compelling necessity of the life of faith. Obedience is the compelling necessity of the life of faith. Now you might say, okay, what's the connection between obedience and faith, and why if I'm a person of faith, do I need to take my obedience so seriously? Well, Genesis 17 shows us at least three factors which should compel us to obey as followers of Jesus. Before we get to those factors that compel our obedience, I want to remind you of where we're at in the story. Remember that Abram is this guy who's been promised by God that God is going to give him so many descendants that he won't be able to count them. The only problem is that he's married to a woman who isn't able to produce any children. He and, and Sarai have not been able to have children. Now they're getting very old. So 10 years after God makes this promise to Abram, Sarai says, to Abram, as we saw last week, uh, why don't you sleep with my maidservant Hagar and have a child by her? And, and perhaps all of God's blessings can be fulfilled through that child. And so Abraham, Abram takes up Sarai on her offer and, and a child is conceived and Ishmael is born. And when he is born, Abram is 86 years old. Now, 13 years have gone by, so between the end of chapter 16 that we looked at last week and the beginning of chapter 17, there's a 13-year gap, and that's basically Ishmael's childhood years, uh, and Abram is living all those years with the assumption that Ishmael is the one through whom all God's promises to him would be fulfilled, <coughs> and then this happens. Look at uh, chapter 17, verse 1. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. 
that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. Now what's about to happen in this chapter is so big, so momentous, so important that God shows up in person to communicate with Abram about it. Now we know in other places it tells us that the Lord spoke to Abram. In chapter 15, for instance, it said that the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision. But this is the first time recorded in Scripture in all of Abram's 90 or 86 years, uh, now 99 years, first time in all of his 99 years that the Lord has showed up in person in this particular way to communicate to Abram. It's that important. Now, we don't know what form that appearance took. Uh, It may be that this was the angel of the Lord, similar as uh, we saw back in chapter 16. The angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar. And we said uh, last week that that was probably a Christophany, uh, a pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the Trinity, uh, coming and appearing in, in personal form to communicate something of importance to a person, to a human being. We don't know that's what's happening here. It's not identified as the angel of the Lord. All we know is that the Lord appeared to Abram, and Abram knows it's the Lord so much so that he falls on his face. He is so in awe of the appearance of the Lord there in front of him. He falls on his face before him. And not only does the Lord appear to Abram, but he identifies himself by a new name. He calls himself here God Almighty. This is the Hebrew name El Shaddai. Now, those of you who've been around a while will remember that song uh, written by Michael Card, I think, and and made popular by Amy Grant uh, back in, what, the 80s? El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Elyon Ha'adonai, Age to Age, You're Still the Same by the Power of Your Name. A great song. Well, this is the first place where that name of God is revealed in Scripture. God is saying, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. This, uh, this name uh, of God is used five times in the book of Genesis, 48 times in the Old Testament altogether. And in the book of Genesis, when it appears, it usually speaks of God's power to, to uh, do what seems impossible, especially as regards the promise of posterity, descendants. Such a revelation of God's nature is especially appropriate here in chapter 17 because of what God is about to reveal to Abram. He has a clear purpose for appearing to Abram in this way and identifying himself as El Shaddai. He wants to make kind of a shock and awe impression on Abram in order to compel his obedience. He says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I want you to be obedient to me, Abram. And here we see the first factor that compels our obedience as people of faith. The power of God's presence compels us to obey. The power of God's presence compels us to obey. God is saying here, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. Walk before me. I want you to realize that your way is in my full view. I see everything that you do. I want you to walk before me and be blameless. I'm the one who has the power to bless you, and I have every right to expect you to walk before me in obedience. He's demanding that Abram live an upright life that's pleasing to God Almighty. Now, I suppose if you have an experience like the one Abram has here in Genesis 17, uh, it's going to motivate you to obey God no matter what he tells you to do next, right? This is pretty powerful motivation to obey. Well, it's not often that God shows up in person to compel us to obey this way. Nonetheless, it's important for us as followers of Jesus to live with a conscious awareness of his powerful presence in our lives, isn't it? I mean, after all, our God is omnipresent. He is always and everywhere present. There is nothing we do that escapes his notice. So much so that the book of Proverbs tells us, For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. The book of Job says, For his eyes are upon the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps. Everything you do is observed by the Lord. Again, in the Psalms it says, You scrutinize my path and my lying down, and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. 
Again, the Proverbs says, the, the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. In other words, as surely as God reminded Abram that his life was lived in full view of Almighty God, El Shaddai, the Word of God tells us, so do we. So do we. The one before whom we walk is El Shaddai, God Almighty. He says, walk before me and be blameless. One of the factors that should compel obedience in the life of every believer in Jesus Christ is the power of his presence. But it's interesting, isn't it, how easily we forget that. And so we do things we shouldn't do, and we think that we got away with it because we've managed to hide it from our spouse or our boss or our our fellow church members, our Christian friends, and as far as they know, it looks like we're doing great. But what we forget is that our ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all our paths. So uh, December 22nd, just before Christmas, I was watching the Channel 10 News out of Philadelphia one evening when they had a breaking news story uh, that was uh, being broadcast from Chopper 10, their news helicopter, we can bring that up now. It was a car chase through the streets of Philadelphia. This uh, blue Dodge Charger was racing through the streets of Philadelphia trying to get away from the police. And uh, to all appearances, I mean, this car is going fast. This is sped up a little bit. It's not quite going quite that fast, but you, you get the idea. The car is going like crazy through the streets of Philly, making turns and going up side streets and doing everything it can to shake the police. The story behind it was that a pharmacy had been robbed and the employees um, were able to flag down a police cruiser and point out the getaway car as they were pulling away. And then this chase ensued. And I think that the people in this blue car were under the impression that they had shaken the police and they were going to get away with something. But as I'm watching this, the whole time I'm watching, I'm saying, as long as that news helicopter is in the sky, they're not getting away with anything. I doubt that they knew that, that, that this helicopter was there. In fact, at one point, the news anchor said, well, let's cut away to the, uh, the pilot of Chopper 10 to let him talk about what he's seeing. And then they said, oh, well, no, he can't do that. And I think the reason why was because the pilot of the helicopter was in touch with the police, and very soon, eight police cruisers kind of convened at one intersection where they cornered this car and, and they, they arrested the two occupants. You, you can take that off now. It's kind of distracting. <laughs> But, but the whole time I'm watching this, I'm thinking, those guys aren't getting away with anything. That news helicopter sees everything. And so it is in our lives, folks, for a man's ways are in full view of a Lord, and he examines all his paths. El Shaddai showed up in person here in Genesis 17 to remind Abram of an important truth. I am God Almighty, and your whole life is lived in full view before me, so walk before me and be blameless. Those who live with such an awareness will be compelled to, be, to obey, will be highly motivated to obey, while those who don't live with that awareness will foolishly think that they can sin and no one will be the wiser. Obedience is a compelling necessity of the Christian life. The power of God's presence compels us to obey. Here's a second factor that compels our obedience, and that's the, the promise of God's blessing. The promise of God's blessing compels us to obey. Because you see, what happens here in chapter 17 is immediately upon commanding Abram to walk before him and be blameless, the Lord then reiterates and expands upon all the promises that he has made to Abram a promises of incredible blessing. So he says in verse 1, walk before me and be blameless. Verse 2, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Well, that's nothing new. God said he would do that for Abram, uh, especially back in chapter 15 when God made a covenant with Abram and made incredible promises to Abram. And one of the promises was you're going to have descendants more numerous than the stars of the heavens. Your descendants like the dust of the earth, so many that you won't be able to count them. So this isn't especially new. Uh, God had, had uh, established that covenant back in chapter 15, a covenant that was entirely dependent upon God's promises to Abram. He didn't ask Abram to do anything back in chapter 15 except to, to, to listen to what God was saying to him. 
And now God is making it clear that, look, there's an expectation that if I'm going to do all that for you, Abram, I should be able to expect your obedience, shouldn't I? It's only fair, right? If I'm going to make your name great and I'm going to make your descendants too numerous to count and I'm going to give them a land to live in, the least I should be able to expect is that you are going to respect me and obey me. The blessings I'm pouring out on you should compel you to obey. But God not only reiterates what he had previously promised, he now expands upon it. It's as if to say, you think all that blessing that I told you about is is, is great? Well, here's some more. Abram fell on his face and God said, verse 4, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. This is new. I mean, previously God had said, you're going to be the father of a lot of people. And now he says, you're going to be the father of a multitude of nations. That being the case, God says, Abram, your name is no longer sufficient. And so he says in verse 5, no longer shall your name be Avram. But your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Abraham was exalted father. Abraham is father of a multitude, father of nations. And he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and, you, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. This too is new. You're going to be the father of nations, and, and the father of kings who will rule those nations. And most notably, we know from Scripture that foremost among those kings is none other than King Jesus himself, right? Because it says in Matthew chapter 1, this is Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. God goes on and says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Here God is saying, not only am I going to give you many descendants, I'm going to give you a land for them to live in. But I'm also going to give you my eternal faithfulness throughout all the generations of those who participate in this covenant. The ideal is God's people in a land God would give them living forever in right relationship with him. He will be their God and they will be his people. This is God's contract with Abram. First presented to Abram back in chapter 15 when God literally cut a covenant with him as we saw back then. It was signed, sealed, and delivered by God through the cutting of that covenant. And here, God is reminding Abram of all of that and filling in some more of the details. And now, 15 years later, God is asking Abram to finally sign on the bottom line. Time to countersign the contract, Abram, to show that you've accepted the terms. And here's how God wants him to do that. Verse 9. God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Now we know something about signs of a covenant, don't we? When two people get married in a church or by a pastor, not just by a justice of the peace, we say that they've entered into a marriage covenant, a covenant before God. The groom has promised to the bride certain things, and the bride has promised certain things to the groom. And then to, to seal their covenant, they exchange rings as a sign of the covenant that they are now in as husband and wife. Well, God was asking Abram and his descendants to wear a sign of the covenant that they had entered into with God. The sign was circumcision. They were to be circumcised as a sign that they had accepted the terms of the covenant. It was to be a constant reminder to them that they were in this covenant relationship with God. And God gets very specific about how that's to be done. Verse 12, he says, He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Now, if getting circumcised seems like 
too big a price to pay to sign the contract, to enter into this covenant relationship with the Lord, the Lord sweetens the deal with an additional and very unexpected promise, even more blessing. Remember, it's blessing that motivates the obedience here. Verse 15 says, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Now, Sarah in Hebrew means princess. I'm changing her name to princess. Why? Because it's far more appropriate for the role she's going to play in the fulfilling of this covenant. Verse 16, I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. In other words, it's not just that you're going to be a father of nations and a father of kings. She's going to be the mother of those nations and the mother of those kings. And so now you call her Sarah, princess, because it's, it's somebody of royalty who, who, who will, will do all of that. Now, this is all new information. Right, Because for 13 years, Abraham had assumed that Ishmael was the one through whom God would fulfill the promises since Sarai had been unable to have any children. In fact, he and Sarah are so old that the whole idea strikes Abram as kind of funny. Verse 17, then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 99 years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, oh, that Ishmael might might live before you. It's like saying, why do it the hard way, Lord? I I mean, I already have a kid. Just bless the kid I already have. Uh, Let Ishmael be the one to carry on my promises and and receive the, the blessings. But God is not one to take the easy way out. In fact, you know what? God often does things the hardest way possible. You know why? In order for us to understand that he's the one who did it. Because only he could. And and he wants Abraham to have no doubt that he is indeed El Shaddai, God Almighty. God said to him, verse 19, No, not Ishmael, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. The Lord is gracious to promise that he will also bless Ishmael but also makes it clear that the covenant promises will flow not through Ishmael, but only through Isaac and his descendants. And by the way, the name Isaac means he laughs. It it captures forever the moment that Abram laughed at the idea of having a son with Sarah in her old age this way. Now let's hit the pause button on our story for just a moment to remember what God has asked Abraham to do. He's just said, Abraham, it's time for you to sign on the bottom line. It's time for you to to accept the terms of this contract that I have made with you. And the way you do that is by being circumcised. Now, that's quite a way to signify that you've entered into a, a covenant, certainly much more involved than wearing a ring on your finger. But as we see in a moment, Abraham obeys without hesitation. Why? He's compelled by the power of God's presence. He's compelled by the promise of God's blessing. I've told you before about how when I was in seminary, Diane and I lived in a mansion. About two miles down the road from the seminary, we lived with this wealthy man who invited seminary students to come and live in his house. Mr. B paid all the bills. He paid the taxes. He paid the upkeep. He paid the snow plowing. He, he paid for everything. Didn't even ask us for rent. He said, you just come and live here. There's a three-room apartment upstairs that you can have that will be yours. And you you share the rest of the house, live in it as if it's yours. The only thing I ask, he said, is that you take out the trash twice a week. And my response was, well, of course. I'll take out the trash once a week in exchange for all that blessing. Certainly I'll I'll do that. And I'll do more, whatever you need. Just ask. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to help. 
Well, you see, what else can we say to our Lord when he says to us, when he asks for our obedience, and he says to us, I will save you from the guilt and grip of your sin by sending my son to die in your place. I will bring you from spiritual death to spiritual life and give you my spirit to live within you. I'll show you how to live life and live it to the full. And, and I'll prepare a place for you in my father's house so that one day you can come and be with me and live with me forever. How about in response, out of love for me, you keep my commands? It's the least we can do, right? Obedience is the compelling necessity of the life of faith. The power of God's presence compels us to obey. The promise of God's blessing compels us to obey. And finally, the prospect of God's judgment compels us to obey. If you look at verse 13, it says, He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised, so shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. And then verse 14 has this warning. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. You see, this is kind of like saying, if you don't wear the ring, we can't be married. If you refuse the sign of circumcision, you can't be in covenant with me. You may be a descendant of Abraham and Isaac, but if you don't take the sign of the covenant, you will be cut off. From my people. That means you won't participate in the promises. You won't participate in the blessings. No, no descendants, no land. Worst of all, I won't see you as my people and I won't be your God. What a sad prospect to, to be born into the family of Israel, but to be cut off from the covenant community and have no part in it, right? But you know what? I wonder how many church going people will be surprised to one day hear. The Lord say, depart from me, I never knew you. And they'll say, but God, I went to church all my life. And he'll say, but you weren't really mine, were you? I mean, you didn't really love me. And I know you didn't love me because you didn't obey me. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Our disobedience may convict some of us and show that we never truly love Jesus. We never really belong to him. I'm not saying that we have to earn our salvation, but I do believe that the lives we live should bear witness to whether we truly are saved, to whether we truly belong, to whether we truly love the Lord. Whether we obey or not is a good predictor of whether one day we'll hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. Or alternatively, depart from me. I never knew you. The prospect of God's judgment is one of the factors that compels our obedience. God says to Abraham, be circumcised or be cut off. And Abraham can't obey fast enough. He's compelled by the power of God's presence, by the promise of God's blessing, by the prospect of God's judgment. And look what happens in verse 22. It says, when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham, so now the, the visit is, is over, but Abram now acts. Then Abraham took Ishmael with his son, uh, his son, and all those born in his house, or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael was his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of the house, those born in his house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. I think you have to agree that Abraham's obedience is impressive here. God says, go to a land I will show you, and Abram goes. God says, be circumcised as a sign of the covenant, and Abraham complies Immediately. Now there's one more act of obedience still to come that is most breathtaking of all. We'll get to that in chapter 22, but even at this stage in the story, I think we can all agree that Abraham shows us that obedience is the compelling necessity of the Christian life, of the life of faith. If you trust God, 
You'll do what he says. Not in some things, but in everything. Not eventually, but immediately. Not grudgingly, but willingly. And so I ask you, people of faith, what is God saying to you today that you need to flat out obey completely, immediately, without argument? Maybe he's saying to you, flee immorality. Maybe saying to you, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Maybe saying to you, wife, respect your husband. Or child, obey your parents, honor your father and mother. Maybe he's saying to you, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Maybe saying to you, tell the truth. Let no deceitful speech come out of your mouth. Let nothing unwholesome come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up that it may benefit those who listen. Maybe he's saying to you, respect your leaders and pray for them. When God commands our obedience, recognize it's not to keep us from having fun. It's always about the delight of El Shaddai in watching us live before him in ways that bring blessing to us and keep us from harm. I like a story told by a pastor about a missions trip that his family took to the Dominican Republic a number of years ago. His son was six years old at the time. And he says, if you've ever, you know, worked in a developing country, you know that the traffic can be crazy. Vehicles whiz past, coming within a few feet of children playing in the street. And he said, one night my, my Son Sam was kind of in a world of his own playing this little game in which he would zigzag back and forth from the, the curb of the sidewalk into the street. And he was kind of stepping up on the curb and then stepping down in the street and going back and forth like this. And, and, and this pastor says, it suddenly occurred to me that something was wrong. He said there was always music blaring loudly and I didn't actually hear anything coming, but it was pitch dark, and from about 10 feet away, I suddenly shouted, Samuel, don't move. And immediately he froze. And about a second later, a moped zipped past him going 30 miles an hour with no lights on right where Samuel was about to step. He says, my six-year-old didn't ignore me, argue, or blatantly disobey. I said, freeze, and he froze, and that obedience probably saved his life. When God, our loving Father, commands us to do something, it's always for our best. It's always for our good. And our smartest move is to obey him completely, unhesitatingly, immediately. Is God telling you to do something today? Do it without delay. Let's bow in prayer. Father, how we thank you for the example of the godly Abraham, for, for his flat-out determination to obey, for the example that we see here in the pages of Scripture. We confess that we're not always so compliant, we're not always so obedient, so ready and willing to do what you say, that we drag our feet, we argue, we complain, we're spotty in our obedience. Lord, I pray, teach us to obey. Teach us to understand that obedience is not something we have to do, but it's something we get to do. To obey you is, is really a delight and a joy. And Lord, I pray that whatever it is you're impressing upon our hearts today, as you're speaking to, to many of us about about things that, that you want us to do, ways you want us to live, how you want us to be. Lord, may we be people who don't put up a fight, but respond with an immediacy of obedience that will bring a delight to you and joy to us. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.